scale, and over the next 35 slides, you'll learn more about macroeconomics than you probably ever learned in university. So <laughs> let's make this quick, but it all, all relates to one thing that we care about. Yesterday, I did a video to one thing that we care about. I'm just testing the audio. Yesterday, I did a video called Bitcoin Catalyst. And the big question is, is all this mayhem in markets potentially a Bitcoin catalyst? Let's jump in. Let's jump into the story. So thank you all for being here. And Bitcoin is strong. Markets are actually in not too bad shape. But let's talk about all of the craziness happening in the world today. And of course, it doesn't matter. You know, it's edutainment at this stage. So the story today really is fascinating. Please fasten your seatbelts because we are going to take a trip around the world and we're going to try to piece together in our innate tapestry around global macro, central banks, interest rates, monetary policy, fiscal policy, recession, um, and a bunch more. And we're going to look at a whole bunch of different countries. And we're going to talk as well, all motivated by the Bank of England action and the historic movements we've seen in markets. So this is just, again, a macroeconomic dream. But first of all, our appetizer, we're going to start with Asia and check out the situation on the ground there. So here, this is a big thank you to Sanjay for sharing with me this article from Nikkei Asia. And they refer to Sri Lanka as a ticking time bomb. And they're not mincing words here. And this is going to potentially cause financial contagion across the region. And I remember the last Asian currency crisis, financial crisis. But let's see exactly how bad that ticking time bomb could be. So we've seen massive movements in currency over the past couple of months. But here, this is how risk happens fast. You can see the Sri Lankan rupees um, just completely being smashed apart. And the sad thing about this is the destructive damage of this currency debasement basically means the people on the ground can't purchase fuel, they can't purchase machinery, which means they can't farm, which means they can't make money. And even if they did, the money is pretty much valueless, losing 75% of its value in a short window of time. This is the problem. But this is not just isolated to Sri Lanka. It's happening all over the world. Here is a quick example of some Asian contagion. Again, top of the list, Sri Lankan rupee. Then you have the Laotian kip, and then Pakistani rupee. And then number four, Japanese yen. Number five, Bangladeshi taka. Then you got the South Korean won. I mean, where in the world do you see a bunch of currencies plummeting? And of course, the plummeting currency is a very early warning sign that there's a problem on the ground, but problem with debt, etc. But here to see countries, you know, like Japan and Bangladesh, you know, Laos in the same breath is really, really bizarre. And it shows you how not only how everything is so interrelated, but also so broken. So in terms of Asian contagion, which countries could be next in the box after Sri Lanka? Well, the interesting thing here is China owns half the debt of many of these places, especially Sri Lanka. And it's very reluctant to take losses on Asian loans. It's putting them under extra pressure. And I know the IMF is trying to help out too, but disaster also looms in Laos, Bangladesh, potentially Pakistan too, as we go forward. But now let's switch gears and talk about the so-called proverbial elephant in the room. I love that expression and I love elephants. But here, the last seven days of events have been quite stunning. And again, <laughs> there are macroeconomists where we thought they'd never live long enough to see all of this unfold before their very eyes. So it's a stunning time to be alive. Also quite terrifying too. So first of all, let's zero in on the UK. And this has relevance for all central banks around the world as well. So here, uh, life comes at you fast, particularly these days if you're a central banker. Uh, but try keep calm and carry on, as they say, in the UK. And I know there's people in the audience here from the UK. But after two days, trying to ignore calls to intervene, and I'll tell you who is calling to intervene as well, uh, Friday's free government tax giveaway trashed the sterling, the British pound. And of course, the Bank of England decided to move in the gilt market, which were absolutely violent over the last couple of days. And uh, this is a huge problem. So again, 30-year UK government bond surged 
over five and a quarter percent Wednesday. That's one and a half percentage points in in just literally one or two days. And the central bank announced it will purchase unlimited amount of long dated debt. I think it goes out 20 years to restore orderly market conditions. We'll talk more about that too. But again, gills across the entire yield curve immediately rallied. Let's talk about this fellow. His name is Quasi Quarteng. He's very confident in his plan. He's the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think he is. But he vowed to stay the course on his economic strategy in the face of a crazy market sell-off that sent the pound to, I think, a record low against the dollar. And he is very confident in his plan, uh, his medium and long-term fiscal plans with close cooperation with the central bank. And he believes the approach will work. But we know what the approach is. It's kind of funny. We'll talk more about that approach in a second. But the markets have no confidence and they swiftly rejected his budget plan and that almost broke the UK bond market. But people ask him, huh? what bond market? How? What does a bond market break mean? Well, we're going to explain that here and how it's relevant. Because again, how the UK is structured is how the central uh, European Central Bank is structured. It's how the US, Canada, etc. They're all the same. But first, let's look at the historical volatility in the debt market. The 10-year guilt has never in its history been hit with such volatility and we are living through history, ladies and gentlemen. But let's talk about bonds for a second as we move the speed of light. Here, just a quick reminder. As interest rates go up, bond prices fall. It's that simple. That little refresher there is what caused this problem and caused a huge amount of pain in the market. Let's walk through exactly how that pain unfolded and who was on the phone looking for 65 billion pounds, which used to be over $100 billion, but it's not anymore because the pound is weak. But here, uh, how it broke the bond market, you, had, you have in the UK about 1.7 trillion in pension debt in bonds. And bond prices collapsed because of the previous image here, as I showed you. Interest rates go up, the British economy raised the interest rates, and bond prices fell. That means the British pound fell and interest rates rose, as I mentioned. Bond price collapsed and pension funds got margin calls because of the debt on debt of how they're all structured. I did a video previously called how pension funds are Ponzi's. I'll add the link here. Check it out if you're interested. Um, but here, and then pensions sold bonds in panic and the markets collapsed. It's that simple, ladies and gentlemen. Now, back to uh, exactly our friends at the IMF. Well, I'm only kidding. Not our friends at the IMF, but they criticized the policy and they launched a biting attack on the UK's plan to implement uh, I think it was 50 or 60 billion pounds of debt funded tax cuts, urging the government to reevaluate the plan. And this is on top of the energy um, money printing subsidy benefit of 100 billion pounds over the next one or two years. And in addition, this happened. They're in increasing interest rates. And of course, then they just bailed out the bond market. So here you have this weird situation where you have. Uh, first of all, the IMF criticizing, which is hilarious. And you've got the clash in fiscal and monetary policy. And then you have other people all over the place saying, oh, this is isolated to the United Kingdom because we'd never do something like that. I think Janet Yellen made a comment. So what possibly could go wrong? In summary, cutting taxes, jacking rates, and printing like there's no tomorrow. It's a simple recipe for disaster. So let's uh, map that in a simple little formula. So you have QE, which is quantitative easing, plus quantitative tightening. Quantitative easing is money printing. Quantitative tightening is increasing interest rates. Uh, quantitative easing is also cutting taxes. And you put those together and you go, huh? <laughs> you, you, we just don't know where this is going to go. And this is all being smashed wide open because of the catalyst called inflation, okay? And rates really did nothing wrong, but when the system gets kind of used to having a zero interest rate policy, the risks are there. As somebody described it as it percolates like a volcano. And once you start jacking those rates, boom, extreme moves happen. Risk happens fast. 
Everything's hit. Collateral, margin, leverage, margin calls, etc. And the Bank of England had no choice but to bail in and literally, a matter of hours, spend whatever it was, £65 billion. So in central bank speak, what does it mean? Well, the Bank of England central bank model, basically, in summary, we can fight inflation and still buy our debt so long as, as it is to calm the market volatility and stop credit markets from exploding. My language, <laughs> I hope it doesn't offend anybody over there. But guess who was exposed to this crisis? Any guesses? BlackRock. They had a huge exposure to this. And they're probably jumping on the phone to all the players saying, hey, can you wire us 65 billion? Because we just got stuffed because you jacked rates and that crushed bond prices. And here we are. Uh, so let's call this the new central bank put instead of the Fed put, as they say in the U.S. So let's look at how the U.S. market reacted. And again, the 10-year is very, very important to look at because the 10-year has been a wrecking ball of late, but it fell 8% in the last 12 hours. That's not 800 basis points, but 8% of where it was was just over 4%. Now it's back down to about 3.7%, uh, if I recall correctly. So that is the impact of how the global markets all look at each other. And this is very important to look at this tenure because that's a long-term estimate of where we believe the Fed funds rate will go or lower, we hope. So let's look at the global central bank rate tracker. Uh, this is super interesting. You see in red, it's places that have actually increased rates of late. You got South Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand. In fact, Thailand, I think, just raised today as well a little bit more. You got pa uh, Pakistan's been quiet for a while. New Zealand, US, Australia, UK, ECB. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But look where rates coalesce, typically between that 35 and 4.5% and and mark. And many of the countries that are at that level have huge amounts of debt burden as well, which will cause a huge problem in the very near future. So the big question many people are asking, could the United Kingdom be the next Greece? And Greece had their own uh, sovereign debt crisis a while back. Well, first of all, this is historical. Um, I don't think the debt to GDP is that much of a red level for the UK right now. But debt market volatility is like what we've seen, like something we've never seen before. The Bank of England as well uh, told the market yesterday that it was going to be very hawkish. Yeah, so... <laughs> They're hawkish and at the same time printing money like crazy. It's just, it just, just doesn't make sense. Um, and today they're buying gilts again, money printing, and the sterling is in trouble. And it's hard to believe that this is happening to a G7 economy so fast. And the management and the fiscal and monetary decisions are just absurd. So with that, let's do a quick currency crisis refresher. Step back in history and talk about some of the most recent ones. We had the Mexican peso crisis in 94, Asian crisis in 97. Uh, that was a great time to buy real estate in Asia, by the way. 1998 uh, financial crisis in Russia. Argentine crisis, still ongoing. Venezuela 2016, Turkey 2017, still ongoing. Sri Lanka 2022, UK. You could argue it's a little bit of a crisis. And then maybe next in the box, Pakistan, Laos, and who knows. But... It's all because of this. Now, we did dis discuss uh, the margin call earlier in the video and the margin call on pension funds. And we are beyond crisis here, ladies and gentlemen. This is a quick refresher of something I shared before in a video called um, uh, Pensions or Ponzi's. But here, the savings gap, this shows you the amount that the world will need in terms of uh, funding today, like as of 2015, out to 2050. 400 trillion is required over the next 20 to 30 years. And that money has to be raised somehow. And that is to provide each person with retirement income equal to, in some cases, 60 to 70% of their pre-retirement income. And as we go forward, when you add up the total amount of people on earth, 400 trillion, just to put that in perspective, is $60,000 per person on earth which is more than four or five times the average salary per person on earth. Where is this money going to come from? It is unfunded. Where is it going to come from? So with that, uh, government pensions, 
are technically, you could argue, proof that they are legal Ponzi schemes because retirees are funded by payments from younger people. Pension funds invest in low-risk treasuries and bonds, which are going illiquid. We just saw that with the big margin call, 65 billion pounds. All are negative yielding. As I say, just a reminder, if you're not making 14% return on investment, you're probably not treading water and you're sinking, okay? Because fiat is being debased at that level. And all are negative yielding. People are living longer. Funds are running out of money. And there's less young people to support more old people per Elon Musk as well. So that's just the world. And speaking of Ponzi schemes, this just came out today too. I thought I'd just insert it here into the story. Uh, this is, uh, he was the world champion of Ponzi's. His name is Bernie Madoff. And uh, the Ponzi scheme just uh, issued another $372 million, call it 0.4 of a billion dollars in payments from a government fund out to victims. So good news for the victims, but again, another example of money printing. So let's talk about the king dollar, because again, trust me, it's we're going to circle back to the Bitcoin story in a second. So the king dollar here uh, is a wrecking ball around the world. And that's the story here of all global currencies are collapsing into the dollar. And then one day soon, it's inevitable, the dollar will collapse into something else. So let's look at the performance of global currencies uh, over the last year or so. Yen is down 28%, Swedish krona down 26%. That surprised me actually how bad the Swedish krona was doing. British pound down 21%, not as bad as the krona or yen. Uh, the euro down 20% and the Swiss franc down 9%. So again, staggering moves, even for really safe haven currencies like the Swiss franc to be down so much. So let's talk about the China market. The yuan tanked to its lowest level today since 2008. All of this stuff is happening fast and it's happening all at once. Hence, there's 35 slides here. Um, but this is a 14-year low against the dollar, despite, despite Chinese central bank efforts to stem the slide after U.S. interest rates prompted traders to convert money into dollars in search of alpha, just because they can get a higher return. Uh, ben, and also from a macro perspective, the weaker yuan helps Chinese exporters by making their goods cheaper abroad. But the problem is it encourages capital to flow out of that economy. A lot of people talk about the kind of the dollar milkshake theory of the US kind of sucking cash in from all these other places. And this raises the cost for Chinese borrowers, of course, and sets back the ruling Communist Party efforts to boost their very weak economy right now all over the world. Now, back to a little bit more distress, and I'm nearly done, I promise. Uh, here, you can see the corporate debt market distress index is rising. That's the red line there you can see on the chart. And this is something that the Fed keeps a very, very close eye on, because once the corporate debt markets collapse, it's game over. Unemployment goes through the roof. Businesses fold. It's just absolutely smashes GDP and growth. This is what the Fed is worried about. This is what I call financial Armageddon. And we are 50 to 100 basis points away if it's not already happening. So in addition, we have uh, gurus in the space. This is Stanley Druckenmiller. He said in an interview today, I think, he said, I will be stunned if we don't have a recession in 2023. I don't know the timing, but certainly in 2023. And I will not be surprised if it's not larger than a so-called average garden variety recession, i.e. really, really, really bad. And I think he used those terms as well. I will not rule out something really, really bad. And he is concerned about the liquidity situation in the bond market after the Fed's activities. That is all about liquidity. And this is what we just experienced in the UK liquidity problem, sovereign debt crisis, whatever you want to call it, this is the issue and things are going to break. So quickly, conclusions here, uh, just to summarize everything we just discussed. First of all, a significant financial risk, uh, financial stability risk. UK was the first shot across the bow to warn the world, hey, things are breaking here, ladies and gentlemen. Second, Bank of England is in the same European Central Bank situation, scrambling to contain financial risk between spreads between Italy and Germany, etc., etc. Everything is in conflict. What the policymakers are doing is causing more volatility. 
Then they break stuff and then they fix it with more money printing. It's kind of head scratching. Uh, fourth, global recession and financial contagion risks exist. It's going to happen. Credit markets are breaking and the markets are smelling a sovereign debt crisis. That's why you see the huge movements in price action and yields. These are the speculators, you know, licking their chops, jumping in to, to arb the heck out of it. And that's what happens. They force the call. I guarantee you somewhere, probably somewhere, somebody in BlackRock just made a ton of money. And by the way, you can say it much more eloquently than I can. But uh, Sailor chimed in a few minutes ago, right before I went live. And he said, when central banks intervene to prop up their own bonds, they cripple capital markets and collapse their own currencies. Sovereign debt is an increasingly ineffective treasury reserve asset. Bitcoin offers sound economic and ethical alternative. Of course, he's speaking his own book, but he's eloquent like hell. And I always refer to this as the Bitcoin life raft video here later. So with that, sorry, <laughs> bigger than expected today because of the stuff that's going on. And, you know, Bitcoin is up 1100 bucks since last night at 8 p.m. So 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Pacific. It's moving in the right direction. I know it's still slightly under $20,000, but again, it shows you, despite the strong dollar, people are looking for that life raft, that safe haven, whatever it is, because there's very few out there in different currencies. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the mods and all the people out there. And, uh, and hope everybody in the UK is doing well and Europe and all around the world. See ya.